I have to say I'm, I'm so proud of every one of you here. Um, you spending the evening hours after a long day at work to come to listen to something. I don't think that you, you came because you are um, curious, because I think you want to gain something so that you can really bring it back and make the world, the life of the people around you, the community that you serve, uh, a better place, not just for you, uh, not for only the, for, for the people who look like you, but for everybody. So I want to thank you so much for being here. And I would like to thank Nicole and Maya and everyone at First Sector New England. And actually, I really appreciate Ning for helping me so much with the high tech. I'm totally allergic to high technology. I either break out or I break the computer that, down or something. So um, I will be, uh, I just want you to know, I hope that I will take only 20 minutes of, of my talking and showing you slides and things like that. And um, uh, please feel free to ask as many questions as you want. Uh, the, the reason that I can be here and speak to you uh, is really big. I built my um, experience and what I have accomplished, uh, not, not for me, but, but the accomplishment that I have forgive me for saying it this way, in a global scale, because of the many, many people that I have to step on there, I, that, that are uh, willing to carry me and pave the path for me to get where I am now. Uh, so uh, to feel free to ask questions, okay? So uh, I am the director of Massachusetts. And um, Worcester, the South Asian Coalition, has become the leader of cultural uh, knowledge. Uh, we have been able to share a lot of our uh, Southeast Asian uh, cultural nuances with many, many people who serve uh, our people, let be public school, to housing, engagement. We have direct and referral services. We have civic and community engagement program, healthcare access, education, business ownership, youth program, and uh, I think the really important part that that we come with an amazing wealth of um, uh, cultural heritage that we add into the call of our cultural diversity of the community that we live in. Uh, for us, it's the city of work. So uh, this, uh, this is just a snapshot of people waiting for direct and referral service at the Southeast Asian Coalition. Uh, we have folks of all ages, uh, from actually uh, prenatal uh, until, oh my goodness, I shouldn't say age, but I also got a phone call uh, some time ago. The lady, the, the my husband, died a few days ago, but we don't know what to do. So, um, you know, it's really hard for immigrants and refugees who don't speak the language, because things like this happen, then what do they do if they don't know where to go to help solve the, the problem? The, the, the problem. We pretty serve from before born until forever. Um, and uh, yeah, anything clients need help with. The lady on the, your left is uh, uh, Tracy Nguyen, and the lady on your right is M. Uh, Chiu. Uh, they both also are uh, uh, former refugees from Vietnam. And we are so very fortunate, I cannot tell you, as a former refugee from Vietnam, and now being able to serve in addition to the Vietnamese, is truly an honor. So the South Coalition, uh, we are very pleased to serve folks from Burma, uh, Iran, Iraq. Uh, we have some from Syria, and uh, we also have from Nepal, Bhutan, uh, Laos, Cambodia, uh, really many, many parts. I, I should say other parts of the world. And, um, 
these folks, these are two different groups of from Burma and gentlemen are from um, Iraq. Has anyone here ever heard the term Mandaean, Mandaean refugees? You know, I am so pleased to share something I learned to a mutual to a professor. And she said, no, I never heard of them. Anyway, so one day, two years ago, Dr. Uh, Lee called me on the phone. I never met him before. I didn't even know what he looked like. And he said, Ms. Ang, I heard that you help refugees. Uh, your organization Yes, we do. Uh, uh, what part of Asia are you from? Because I assume that he, he's from Asia. And he said, well, kind of from Asia. Well, to make a long story short, he said, I really need to meet you today. And I said, you have to wait, you know, because I have lots of things going on today. And he said, do you walk from the garage to your house? And I said, no, I, I live in Boston. I don't have a garage. And he said, oh, that's even better. It would take you a longer time to find a parking spot. So can I meet you in Boston where you park your car? I find you. And then wherever you park your car, I will just talk to you from there to your house. So up, and I hope that he he's sick. He want to come. He couldn't come. Not far from our house, because person I had never met him, but he would be home. Uh, and so. Uh, Sponsor the influx of the Middle Eastern refugees to Massachusetts. Do you know that? I think there's about 3,000 Mondayans in uh, Massachusetts now resettled from. Well, Mondayan refugee, Mondayan, uh, Mondayans are the direct descendants of John the Baptist followers. So they predated Christianity, they predated Christians, and they were ethnic minority in Iran and Iraq. And they were scattered. Uh, at, there's a lot of persecution for religious reasons or whatever. So they scatter all over the world. I heard that there used to be about 60,000 of them, but now there are less than 3,000 in the Middle East, and the rest are everywhere. But yes, where the largest uh, concentration of money it is right here in Worcester, in central Massachusetts. Um, so, so, in a way, Worcester is such a great place because of refugees uh, and immigrants. I think we have a lot of threats in the world that not many people know about. Don't you love? I will tell you why they are there later. And uh, we also have civic uh, and community engagement. Um, we were uh, we compete the dragon boat and. We, we didn't make the five, <laughs> but we tried very hard. And that we're helping our uh, folks to uh, uh, register to vote and English second language. And we also encourage parents and grandparents to, to read to their children, to our, our grandchildren, 20 minutes a day. Uh, and we have uh, tutoring for high schools. And uh, in this group right here, uh, the, young, the, the young man on the left, uh, Danny Ngo, is Vietnamese. Thea is uh, Karen. She's from Burma, but she speaks Karen language. And uh, Aisha is a refugee, also from Burma. And we have a focus group. Here we talk about public school, what they expect from the public school uh, for their future. And somebody from the public schools is there as well. Uh, so we do health care, uh, and uh, this is our, so we were able to meet with a group of mental health. So I know a wonderful group uh, that serve the mental health uh, area for uh, Asians back there, and you're going you're gonna to hear from me all of the time. I'm going to need your help. Uh, these folks are from the world as well. Africa, parts of the world. And this is our garden um, 
every time Vietnamese see a strip of grass that has nothing to eat, to be eaten, we think it's such a waste. Flowers and grass are such a waste. We have to grow something that we can eat. So this is a light the strip of grass and our elders complain about it. So I suggest it, so we get a small grant and there we go. Um, so they also, the reason I uh, push in for this because when they do this, the, when they did this, they also went to the library. Yeah? Um, this is um, another, we do this almost once, uh, we do it often, we go to the elder, to the senior center to speak with elders. So we inform them many things, voting, uh, flu shots, everything. And you know, in the Asian community, uh, older, elder parents are kings and queens. They go home and they tell their kids what to do. And so, to let one, one elder know, at least three other people will know. So it's a really good plan, I think. Um, and we have knitting and we have embroidery. Uh, all of these amazing people come to this country with incredible skills that either extinct in the world, extinct in this country. And why do we send things overseas to be made when we have them right here? Uh, oh, so this is one of my favorite story. Uh, one of our clients, uh, you know, they, when people have mental health uh, uh, issues, uh, anxiety, depression, PTSD, or whatever, do you know that arts and creativity are really helpful for them? So when they come to our office, we always give them something to make, and they end up making uh, uh, something like paper flowers or whatever. And this is the gala of the annual fundraising gala for Healthcare for All. It's also a really great organization. And they used to fund us. And I, uh, um, they said, we want to support you. What can you, do? what can you make? What can you do? And I was thinking, you know, all of these people didn't have a job. And they're so good with what they can do. So I suggest, can we make something for you that you can use for your gala? So we ended up uh, have a grant and 100% of that money go back to the people who make them. And as you can see as a uh, centerpiece for the Gala at Healthcare for All. And uh, this is a knitting program. We were able to get the elders to be busy. Uh, the previous one was the Vietnamese, and this group, uh, uh, she's from Syria, uh, he's from Nepal. She's from uh, Bhutan, and the other two ladies from Burma. And when they finish with the knitting, the, it become the cozy for the cups. Uh, it become gifts for this company that asked us, contracted us to do it for them. So this is the final products that we, we were able to make for them. And embroidery, uh, and putting sequins in clothes, uh, this is our, this is the superintendent of the of, the, uh, of a was a public school, and we have an amazing uh, troupe for lion dance, um, and uh, Tony loved music. So when he came to school, the kids would go to office to do whatever they want to. I told them you don't even have to ho do homework here because being a Vietnamese child, my parents forced me to do homework. And um, until I go to bed, actually. So I they all have to turn in their great uh, report card. So if they, their grade go down, or if they in kind of a shaky situation with their grade, then they cannot be a part of some events like lion dance, uh, troupe, something like that. But never happened yet. And they can come and do whatever they want to. Let be filmmaking. Uh, music or just chit chatting. And uh, this is our kitchen. So everyone here doing their thing and eating, eat. Uh, and we also very with the open uh, We with the lion uh, dance, uh, we were able to, we got a grant from um, Attorney General Amara Healy and we used the lion dance to go to different, uh, actually our children, all of the public school in the city of Worcester. So uh, we 
we use the light dance to get the attention, and then from there we bring out our fires just to bring awareness about uh, uh, opioid danger and prevention, and uh, call uh, if if they have questions, if they have concerns. And so this is our youth, and this is uh, that's. Uh, a little baby, one of our, our former youth came back to visit us with one of his baby, with, with, with his first child. We have the Asian festival once a year. The about 3,000 people came, and we have about the community in the city of Worcester is really wonderful. It's free, and we practically brought Asia to Worcester doorstep. Is the the um, uh, what you call them, the costume, to the artifacts, the musical instruments, everything is 100% authentic for their country. And some of them, including my own father, I will show you later how hard it is was for us to flee the country to come, you know, to go to across the sea. And it's amazing that some people would try to bring artifacts, uh, musical instruments, with them, why they swimming or climbing over gates? I will tell you later. And so this is a part of the Asian festival that we had, and the mayor uh, and Patty, Joe, Mr. Patty, and this was uh, uh, McGovern's there, and Mimi is uh, one of the Vietnamese medical students. Our performers. So, shall the and we have at least five thousand Guruji at our uh, events, um, and a hundred clients uh, uh, were employed. Uh, we have more than nine small business owners as of today. Uh, we, we are very fortunate to have new health programs that uh, uh, address diabetes, mental health, and dental care for our clients. Uh, we have 19% increase in new clients in 2015. And the best part, the 14% increase of Worcester Asian American voters that actually went out and cast their vote. And this number comes from uh, Mass Taylor. Uh, uh, mass vote, uh, vote table, and we all of that. The reason we could do it because we have more than three hundred volunteers. Our youth program is wonderful. One hundred percent of graduation, one hundred percent of them uh, pursued high education, uh, and uh, last year thirty-one youth were hired as part-time employees somewhere or at with us. So the Southeast Asian present in Worcester, we act, we act as a bridge connecting the Asian community to the city and the greater community. Uh, we help to prepare Asians to become contributing citizens. We provide a safe place for Asian youth to grow holistically away from drugs and gangs off the streets, stay in school, um, pursue higher ed education, and volunteer. And we also a cultural partner and consultant to others. And uh, I would like to share with you this wonderful story about both program, also mental health coach. Um, and in this particular picture, uh, Bo was given the Community Hero Award by the uh, Asian American Commission of the, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Asian American Commission. And um, Bo is uh, in his late twenties now, but when he was young, he's the number four. Uh, he grew up in the refugee camp. Uh, his parents survived the Pol Pot regime, uh, and it was life was really difficult for both of for for all of them. Um, and uh, last year, refugee camp that his parents uh, 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 that he were. That 
and he always wanted to go back to tell the kids there that you you will one of these days you will you don't have to be this way you you can rise above all of this uh, you are special your mind of your heart is very very special what it will take you to survive and survive with dignity and with honor and uh, Uh, my presentation uh, to the slideshow, but I would like to bring us back to why we are here today and what Third Sector New England is doing with the TSNE uh, mission work. Um, the, I like what they wrote that in the midst of today's hostile political climate, grassroots organize, organizers remind us that the struggles of oppressed people are not new. So Third Sector New England Mission works with their long history of nonprofit capacity building, seeks to use their platform to lift up the voices of grassroots community organizers working on some of our society's most pressing issues. And uh, from what you saw, I hope that you also recognize uh, three things that Third Sector New England Mission work pointed out to you in your letter is the creativity. A lot of that is really out of the box thinking because at the very beginning when I was hired for this job, our organization just did translation and interpretation. And we have ESL class, we have the youth program. It's like a babysitting, you know, like keep kids, keep kids off the street. But the more I work with the, with the refugees and immigrants, not just from Asia, but from other parts of the world, I think we have a gold mine right here. We have a hidden treasure right here waiting to be, to be acknowledged and to be discovered and to be invested. Uh, they, in my opinion, they are really an incredible uh, resource for all of us. Um, and so the is that I, uh, I do something really crazy like the garden. And you know that from that little stretch of garden, you know what happened? We, we got a grant from a Massachusetts Department of Agriculture. So we're gonna uh, grow, oh my goodness, I really hope that someone from the building, of my building won't be mad at me, but we're gonna have a, a hydroponic garden in my office. And so, because in the winter we couldn't grow Asian herbs, and um, one uh, very intellectual folks called this project uh, food justice, cultural food justice, and I don't like to use the word justice in, in, because, uh, because, well, so I would like to call just cultural heritage uh, herbs growing, whatever you call it. And so with that, we will be able to use the herbs that we'll be growing in the winter. It costs a lot more money for people, especially if you don't have a lot of money to go to the shop, the store to buy. Uh, fresh herbs. You know how much it costs at Whole Food, right? A little package of basil is three dollars something. Anyway, so um, we we're gonna grow that there, and then we have a professional kitchen that we will be able to allow uh, all of the elders from Iran, Iraq, Asia, Burma, Vietnam, whatever, to make something. And with that, um, I'm already signed up for several fairs on the street so that they will be able to showcase their food. Uh, uh, and thing, and the flower making thing. I'm just so grateful. You know, with our kind of work, you have to believe in miracles. You have to some God up there because who with the flowers we will be able to bring in three thousand dollars with the paper flowers, and who, who would have thought that with the knitting program I was able to hire thirty one elders and people who don't speak English, people who don't have a job for a long time to have extra money between the month of uh, November and December. And some of them collect cans in the winter, collect cans for a living. And can you imagine collect cans, collecting cans in, in our winter here? And if you're from Asia, it's hard. So uh, creativity, you know, innovation start where you are able to recognize the gifts from other people, the, the something within other people. Um, 
and resourcefulness. I'm sure you've seen that too, right? And resilient. Oh my goodness. If you could see uh, Moa, uh, the terrible things, the hard thing that he had to go through in order for him to take care of his family. Uh, he's had to quit school at 15 years old in order for him to provide for his mom and uh, his siblings. Uh, and that's just one of the millions of stories about uh, not just refugee and immigrant, lots of a lot of us who are low income, we, we survive because of our resiliency. So um, I mentioned to you about 300 volunteers who has helped us. The two things I would like to stress, volunteerism is one of the most uh, wonderful things that America has taught me when I came to Vietnamese refugees. Um, and after uh, so many years of being supported, I realized that um, we all have to be mindful when we volunteer, when we extended our help or reach out to others to help. There's a, a blurring line between handing out and helping. Uh, volunteer is really is a two-way win-win. Uh, we learn from each other. We give to each other. And uh, the reason I mentioned this because I was in the receiving end and needing, needy. Uh, when I first came here, I had nothing. I will show you how later when I, why I had nothing when I came here. I was and the people different between. Uh, helping and handing out. Uh, the, the, one of them upholds dignity, my dignity, and one lacks of it. And, and so um, I'm grateful for what kind of help I got. But losing you, a sense of losing one's dignity because one receiving help is terrible. I really think that. Um, is all of our responsibility to make sure that the human dignity is always uphold and respected and preserved and protected at all time, whether we help someone or not. And second thing is, um, with what happening right now, um, I was at the march in came. I was at the women's march last year in Washington D.C. Then and I was here in Cambridge, and. Um, I was, I was so, it's something inside me, just so happy. I felt so special. Uh, and, and I kept trying to figure out why I felt this way. And do you know something? It is truly a privilege, uh, 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 an incredible privilege to be, to express your opinion. I came from Vietnam, and all, I'm also Asian, and I'm also a woman. All of those things, three things, have always been a barrier for me to express myself freely and uh, to express not for other people as well. And I remember when I was in Vietnam, bomb was exploding all over me every day of my life in Vietnam. I didn't leave until I was 22. I'm 64 in March now. And uh, never a day that I did not hear explosion close to me. And I always I believed that I would die the next day. And my sister, Debbie, uh, slept next to me. Uh, and she dug her finger into my flesh and she, because she was so scared. And finally, I said, every time we heard explosion, so I said, just assume that we're going to get hit by one of those mortars and blown to bit and die and go to heaven the next day. I got to sleep. And you know, the sad thing is, is the, in the thought of going to be blown to bit and die has become the lullaby that I'll, Keep, allow us to sleep. And the next day when we woke up, we're just so happy that we were alive. And we, I thought of America. I read some books, Old Man the Sea, and something about saw American soldier on the street of Vietnam. And there's such a sense of they own their fate. They are not controlled by fate. For some reason, I, felt, I thought of it that way. And Vietnamese, and then later on when I came here, I worked with international people. Many people in the world so look at the USA as a hope for humanity. If they need a place to, to take refuge, 
uh, in Vietnam, you know, I never thought I could go to America. I mean, it's just a, only a dream. But that hope, America, like a little light at the very end of a very dark, very long tunnel. But that light is still bright. It's still there at the end of that long, dark tunnel. But fast forward to what we're having right now. When we tell the whole world loud and clear, we don't want refugees. Too bad. You know, if you came here 15, 16 years later, we can go out even though you pay for it, um, you know, whatever. You know what I'm talking about. We did not, for the longest time, I really believe that the U.S. has been that hope for all of us. And now, where is that hope? Whether we can fulfill it or not. People said, how could America be a hope when a black people get hosed at, dog bit them, Martin Luther King was killed, you know, a lot of terrible things happened. A dear friend of mine uh, produced this great documentary that please, if you have time, you must watch it about Lorraine um, Hansberry, the, the, the writer of uh, Raising the Sun. It's such a wonderful documentary. It's still going on right now uh, at um, uh, WGBH. And people said, with all of this, you still think that America is, the ho is hope? Yes, because we all can go down the street. That's why I felt so amazing in Cambridge last weekend. That's why I felt so amazing among a million of people in Washington, D.C. last year, because no, we don't have a massacre. The foundation of this country still said freedom is for all. So anyway, that's all I'm going to say. Maybe let me show you a Two minutes um, uh, of this uh, training. I don't know how I can show you, but this is me. <laughs> okay, so Rory told me that they went through thousands of footage of, of the, uh, the, um, what the journalists from all over the world collect, uh, you know, film this particular last day of Vietnam. And she picked just some f part of it for the whole documentary. And maybe several, uh, maybe several seconds, what, one minute or two of, of uh, whatever she needed for the trailer. And that's me, my mom, this is my mom. My sister, this uh, is me. And so um, I think the graph Root organization, the reason we grasp roots because we know what it takes for us to overcome. We, we know how people feel. We want it to be there. Grassroot, we, we, we didn't do grassroot work for money, but an incredible wealth in, inside us, in our, in our life. The relationship we have with each other, it is so incredible, so rich, so precious, so priceless. And you know, um, I'm 64 in a few, uh, in a couple of months, and I do not regret anything. I lost many things over and over again. I was able to some way, somehow overcome. But the relationship that I have had with all of the people, because they knew how I felt. I knew how they felt. We are there for each other. The Me Too movement and the uh, Women's March. You know, the, I just wish people didn't politicalize it too much, because a friend of mine who's a doctor, she's uh, she had uh, multiple sclerosis. How would you say that? And so did she decided to quit her uh, her medical profession, and she always wanted to take pictures. So she got a camera and traveled all over the world, take photos. And one of the photos she sent me last year was three women in Tibet, uh, either Nepal or Tibet, I don't remember, was walking their, either their cow or their, some big animals, three of them wearing the pink hat. They themselves do their own march in their own village, in that part of the world. Many of us are being assaulted or harassed or whatever you go, being prejudice happened to all of us. But the movement really helped us to understand that Someone out there, we don't know them. They know how I feel. They respect me, even though it happened to me. So it doesn't matter what happened to me. I am understood. I'm respected. That's my dignity. So thank you so much for being here. And 
ask me as many questions as, as you want. You are our future. So take as much as you can from me, from, from other older people. We are the one who's, who really have to open the doors, giving you the opportunity and raise you so that you can be the best you can be for yourself and for everyone on a global scale. I think um, that's a very good question. I, came, I went to uh, quite a few meetings in the last five years uh, working in healthcare and many uh, uh, education and many things, and there's amazing ideas, wonderful ideas to help uh, people who, you know, isolated or who cannot, you know, in order for us to narrow the gap of disparities, lesbian poverty or whatever. Amazing idea, lots of money, lots of big plans, but it could not it couldn't be practiced because there's the huge gap between the all of the amazing plans to, and people who could use the plans so that they will become self sustainable and thrive and become contributing citizens and because of that your question is very to have to come to the table with you so that we can, they can be a part of the policy making, that we can learn about what in the past and what did not work, and what can work. Uh, and in order for us to do that, we really have to uh, build relationship with the people in the communities. Uh, I cannot name, okay, so months ago, Boa and I went to this really big organization uh, on mental health, and we were told that we need your help because we have all of these great uh, p uh, people that uh, need mental health. We give them X amount of months for uh, treatment, and now uh, they're done. We don't know what to do with them. Can you help us to put them back in the community? And that's where the problem is, because even I cannot do that. I have to go back to their community to find out where they're from, what language they speak, what community they come from. I need their community to come alongside with me and say, let's work on this together. And in order for us to do that, uh, we have to go physically. And sometimes it's, and you was, for example, uh, with your organization, and you try to if, uh, a certain community has a certain language, you would say, you would have in the language and say that uh, if you, uh, you would like very much to work with them uh, and you're going to uh, create a focus group or information group in the, in the uh, com community center on a day, please, uh, you know, uh, contact, you know, let me know if you need write or whatever it need for, for, bring your question. We are here to help and we expert in whatever, healthcare, housing, Ever. And uh, the, you, I think in order for us to get to there, for example, you're from Boston and you want to work with someone in Worcester, uh, get together with the faith uh, groups, let's be at the mosque or Buddhist temples or churches, and speak with them and say, I would like very much to see how I can bring my program to support uh, your community members. Uh, speak with the representative of the group, the South Asian Coalition right now, we support very many different groups and we also have an uh, Arabic speaking group uh, in, our, in our office as well. So go directly to the leader of the community or the people that take care of their own community 
and that way all of the brilliant ideas will be able to be uh, implemented properly and effectively. And but I I hate to say this again, funding is so important. When um, we were told that look, we have all of these people that go through the uh, uh, treatment, we don't can we just give them to you and you plug them back in the community? Well, you know what? My organization or whoever you want to work with will also need some kind of funding in order for us to do that part of the work for you. So uh, work together. Let it be a, a cultural competency, a technical, technical assistance, uh, funding, whatever. We have to work together. I hope I answered your questions. Yes. You know how how do you when you look at this picture? Um, how do you, you know how what do you see um, about who that woman at that time was in the moment? Uh, so that's the first question, and I'm also curious about the story of how you came to understand that this this footage that this was you in this this clip. The other question that is, this is not really connected, but somewhat is, um, within communities of color, across difference, in our different experiences of oppression within the United States, and I'm thinking specifically about native-born people of color, African-Americans, and people of color who are immigrants, and how we understand our distinct experiences of oppression, because they are very different. And I've been doing some work around this relationship, and it's very challenging to not get, get into a, uh, a dynamic of, um, well, let's, let's try to not really compete, but, you know, well, you know, my impression is this, and your impression is that, and, and, and it's very hard for us to understand, as, as people of color, that our experiences as people of color are very different. And as an African-American woman, my experience of being black in this US has a very different kind of feel. So I, don't, I appreciate that you are feeling hopeful. I don't always feel so hopeful yeah. as a black man. Thank so, you. Yep. So I, that's my question. Oh, I, I really appreciate your question. Very important to me. The first question when I saw that picture, what happened? You know what happened to me when I, I saw this picture? My brother, actually, I sent the, the link to my sibling. I said, look, this is just like how we left Vietnam. I, I didn't even see this part, right? And I screened it four times. I didn't see it. And my brother sent back to me four frames, like a, like a tenth of a second each, and I turned phone off right away. I could not even deal with it. And my sister posted on Facebook. And for immediately, immediately, I had a nervous breakdown. This is only about I, maybe last year. This, I don't remember when this documentary uh, started, April of last year. And um, I bit my nail. And I, the habits continue to this day, a year later. I still, and I couldn't get up in the morning. I, I, I like, totally, really desolate, felt like I could not do anything. The only reason that I could get up, I, I was like that. The only reason I had to get up, because I have an organization that I sold visits a year. I have to get funding for my staff. I, the, youth have, the youth come every, they're supposed to come Wednesday to Friday only, but they always show up Monday and Tuesday. If, you know, last week, uh, they have school clothes because of the storm. Guess where they, they showed up? At my place, okay? 
So I cannot explain to you, but I can only tell you that there's some tr trauma. I don't know what it was, but that hit me like a 20 million ton truck. I got a, a nervous breakdown because of that. And the second question, when I was in Vietnam, I read about Malcolm X. I read some other stories about black people and white people. And, it's and I made an assumption that that was uh, fiction. I didn't believe that it was, you know, this is prior to 1975. I didn't think it was real. And I mean, back then we didn't have TV, so I couldn't really see uh, image, you know, news either, everything on radios. And um, when I came here, I, I still didn't get it either. I, I still didn't see that. But um, it happened very subtly. My knowledge of the discrimination of, about black and white is uh, very subtle. I know many, many wonderful white people, but I have to say they're racist, but they don't know they're racist. They think they are fine. So, you know, these very quiet things, that's why I talk to you about the dignity. You can help someone or you don't help somebody. If you help someone and in such a sense that their dignity is restored, what does it take for us to do that? That's where we really understand how we don't break other people because they're different than us. Different colors, different language, different class, whatever. I cannot name the name of the ethnic group that I'm serving. They speak the same language. We help them. We have a class with two groups. And the next day they said, I can't do this together. We can do this together. It has to be two different classes because we cannot be in the same place with each other. And I told them, no, I, can, I only have grand enough for one program. I cannot make it two. And I came home and complained to my husband, these people, don't they know that like, uh, they, 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 we all are the same. And Philip said, they have almost a century of civil war. They killed, their, they, they used to be killed by generation, but their own generation, they need to have time for him. F your question is very, very difficult uh, to figure out. And after I watch um, friend Tracy Heather, uh, of Tracy, uh, the documentary on um, Lorraine Hansberry, uh, she's a black writer, and she's the one that wrote A Race in the, uh, in the Sun, and she became very active in the freedom movement. I, I couldn't sleep. I actually, that sense of, uh, I may have a nervous breakdown again. God knows, I'll tell you the truth last night when it was uh, snowing and raining and whatever, I just, I was so, this, it's a terrible sinking feeling inside me that all of these um, discriminating is so subtle, but it's very sharp. It cut the wound deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. So what for us to really make that wound to heal quicker? I don't know. I don't know except my husband told me that a marriage is a commitment to help the other person to grow. So what does it take for us to help the other person to grow? I'm very different than him. He is as quiet as a clam, and I'm very noisy. We're 100%, 180% different. I have to tell him what I need to grow. He had to tell me what he need to grow. He needs space. He needed to leave him alone. And I need lots of people. So 40 years later, we still have lots of ups and downs. But I really think the first step is a commitment to dialogue in peace.
forgiveness. There's so much that, please forgive me for saying this, and I have many wonderful white friends, but there's so much for, Af uh, for black people to forgive and for the white people to ask for forgiveness. I really mean it. And a lot of that out of really good, in good intention, um, we have to be able to talk with each other. We need to say, this is what I need for you to help me to grow. This is what I need for you to help me to grow. And that is the only thing I can tell you. And first of all, I have to also apologize. If I say anything or show you any pictures up here that hurt your feeling, please forgive me. It's totally out of my ignorance, and I want to learn to be better. I hope I answer. I mean, it's just a teeny little bit something, two words, something better. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I know that we are streaming, so I'm, I'm being very vulnerable here, and I just ask for forgiveness from everybody uh, watching, in, you know, listening in this room and watching, you know, whatever. Uh, I, this is at the hardest time for me in the last 40 years that I came here. Uh, the last part of my speech I told you is that for the whole entire world for the longest time, and we're losing it. We lost it. Uh, uh, even though that hope is a tiny little bright light at the very, very long and very dark tunnel, but we always know that that in, in on the uh, liberty, that this land see people who are weary, or who don't have a place, who need a place to take refuge. Now we say it in that way no more. It's not like that anymore. You go away. We don't want you. It's the hardest year since I came here. It's harder than when I was in Vietnam, worrying about whether I'd be dead or not because of the disappointment that I have had as a Christian. And I was an evangelical Christian. And as a Christian, I was taught by my belief that we take care of foreigners in our land. We take care of people who don't have, don't have, period. And uh, somewhere in the Bible said, if someone asks you for a coat, take your own coat and give it. And my disappointment is that majority of the eventual Christians voted against uh, refugees and immigrants. And I'm, you know, uh, this is their land too. Uh, this, uh, this is a country of freedom. We are free to vote, we are free to do whatever we want to do. But I'm 64 soon. For the last 63 years of my life, I really thought Christians are to embrace people who don't have enough. So if we have enough, we share, we do this, we... we so... That is the uh, uh, deep disappointment I have. Uh, and second disappointment is also very profoundly, and please forgive me, I am telling you the truth and I'm sticking my neck out to be chopped. Many refugees, especially those from Asia, also supported this bill that not allowing refugees and immigrants to come to this country or to repatriate them. And so to answer you that question, I, I struggled with this for the whole entire year. I wanted to, build, to burn many bridges, but I made a decision that I, I almost even wanted to um, unfriend a bunch of friends. So can you see something years of my life with all of the past friends? I have a lot of them who disagree with what I'm doing right now. 
I can unfriend all of them. But I made a decision that no, I'm willing to love them. I, I, we have to let love take over. We have to, to be willing to say, I want, I still, in spite of all of that, I still want the best for you. But at the same time, would, whatever I can do, I will support those. I believe that refugees and immigrants, nobody wants to leave your country at all. Uh, you had to do it because you had to. You know, a gun on your little child's head, something like that, you, just like that. Why that Aiden, that little boy, uh, parents put him on a boat and then he end, ended up face down uh, at the beach somewhere in Europe. You remember that boy from, uh, was a Syri Syrian? You know, why do, would parents do that out of huma your own, our own humanity? What do we do for those people? Look at uh, when you drive through uh, the USA, you know, so much land, so much food. Why couldn't we do something for people who didn't have a place to live, who didn't have food to eat? So, you know, asking that question, but together, we're going to make a difference to the person next to us. We will, we will support one another, just like what my husband said. I'm helping you. I commit to help, you, to help you to grow, to be the best you can be. So let's just start with that. Mother Teresa said, we all can change the world by loving the next person, the person next to us. Let's do that. And you know, Martin Luther King and Gandhi, it's just so amazing how nonviolence overcame violence, yes? The whole world looked to that. And believe it or not, uh, the Women's March started here in America. But see, the telecast is all over the world. Something good happening here in the USA, not because we are American, but because we are people of the world. So let's start from there, and don't let anyone dis, dis, um, discourage you. If I could climb over that gate, and you know, when I climb over that gate, you see the barbed wire? Um, all of my clothes were shredded. My, you know, I, when I jumped down from that platform to the floor, my clothes float up like ribbons. I was completely naked, no shoes. And now, look at what I have. The best part is that I could be here to share with you that we will always overcome. We, ha we are here for each other. Thank you. I didn't think I answered your question, but. Or a transfer 
from one person to the next in order to achieve understanding and unity? Or is it something that is naturally instilled in each and every one of us? This is really an excellent question. I think that's a great question. That is a really great question. Uh, E3, I like that very much. You know, empathy, I have to find out the exact meaning of what empathy is in English. Uh, it, I think it has many things in the word empathy. Kindness, respect, uh, forgiveness, giving, you know, laying one life down for other, understanding. I'm willing to be in your shoe, you know, I'm carrying you. You know, to, to Vietnamese, the Vietnamese language has a lot of uh, visual images in it. So, um, I really feel that your generation, majority of you here, the people who are, you know, in your teens, 20s and 30s, your generation understand empathy so much better than people who are older than you. And I really mean it. And the people who are older than you went through a lot of things because they're older than you. They have a lot more experience. But for some reason, they forgot how, how they felt when they had difficulties. And so I'm not criticizing anybody at this point now, but um, I really think that in order for us to inspire, impart, show empathy, we have to start at where we are, each one of us. If we believe, if you believe that empathy is something that's gonna change the world, you have to start where you are. And whatever it takes for you to do that, do that with love, do that with passion, do that with compassion. Love, passion, compassion will be so addictive so um, con con contagious, the next person will do it. You do it, three person will get it. Each three person will do it. That will be another three, you know, before you know it. it but it has to be like a pebble tossed on, on the water. It has to be a ripple effect because we cannot have a plan, okay, this is how we're gonna do empathy. Step one, do this, step two, do this, step three, do it. It, empathy is a very beautiful thing. It has multiple language. It's like a huge diamond with many, many facets. It's a, it's a diamond that give life, that, that really draw people in. So to make it as simple as I can say it, live your life in such a way that people see empathy in you, see dignity, see how you dignify others. And that's how you change the world. And that's what Mother Theresa also said. So, thank you. Thank you. 
suspicious about the intention of the, the I see. So uh, please forgive me if I help help me out. Okay. So you wonder if uh, how to deal with uh, people being suspicious with the government, like because I've come from Vietnam and the Vietnam War happened there and kind of destroyed a lot of stuff, everything sort of, and so I had to leave my country to come here. How could I restore the trust of the people, the same people that came to my country and destroy us? Is that what your question? Yeah, essentially, you know, the, the U.S. government was worried about conflict in the Philippines and Hawaii and the champion of capitalism, right? But people here in this country are starting to have more and more of a sense of trust in the government. And so they were worried about the government being able to take advantage of the people that they were trying to take advantage of. And so they were worried about the government being able to take advantage of the people that they were trying to take advantage of. So how do you see it? And, and uh, you know, it's very, it must be difficult as you know, this man here. Yeah, I. I, I'm not so sure if I understand your question uh, I, uh, about communism, uh, and uh, I know that that's what started the Vietnam War to stop the spread of, uh, of communism, uh, communi communism in Asia. Uh, you know, it's a long story, but I will try to make it short. Okay, so Vietnam for many, many years were dominated by somebody else because we are such a great, beautiful little country. We're along the coast. So if you could invade Vietnam, you will invade the rest of Southeast Asia. You know that, right? So, I mean, you know that, but I mean, according to the map, that looks like it. So, um, so for many years, Vietnam was dominated by other people, big people, China, France, Japan, and, uh, and, um, and then the American War happened. Uh, during the time that the French occupied Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh uh, fought against uh, the French so that Vietnam will regain uh, independence. And uh, I think toward the 1940s or something like that, the end of 1940s, uh, Ho Chi Minh wrote uh, President Truman saying that American with your uh, human right, would you step in and help broker communication between us and the French and ask the French to give Vietnam independence? We have, uh, actually went um, um, at one of the battles that Ho Chi Minh's troop uh, won, beat the French. Baring Square, he gave a speech, and it's pretty much translate word by word from the Declaration of Independence of the U.S. Okay, so but at that time, uh, President Truman had his hand tied because that uh, during the Second World War, France was your ally, and it's a bigger fish than Vietnam. So he, they. The you know forgive me the, a lot of this can be murky. So the United Nation agreed to divide Vietnam to uh, North and South, and then people two years later people can vote whether they're going to continue to be communists or whether they're going to be they're going to have democracy. But it didn't happen that way. The communist bloc, the Eastern Bloc, wanted to hold on to the South Vietnam, uh, North Vietnam, and the American you know tried to fight help us. Uh, to keep, to fight the North, but as you can see, uh, there's a lot of things for us to not to trust. W Vietnam is to me like a a game, like a chess game, uh, being played by two different people, and they try to beat the other, and we just happen to be the the chess pieces that get knocked out. But I want you to remember one thing. It doesn't matter whether it was right or wrong. There's something else still very beautiful that came out from that terrible, horrific, bloody war. When I came back to Vietnam, I'm always af I was very afraid for the communists. The North. And in the year 2000, my husband went uh, to Vietnam for, uh, for a humanitarian project. And it was 
when I started in Vietnam. And um, when, uh, because I was invited to be there to speak, and they asked me three questions. The first question was, the, the student, the, the medical students, uh, the, this is in Hanoi, and uh, the first question was, uh, why did you leave Vietnam when your country finally united? There's North and South, there's one country now, which was true. The second question was, um, live among uh, your enemies, the people who drop bombs on, on, on your own people. Um, did the American ever come? They lost the war. Long, uh, I cannot end. Well, the first question, because of these questions, I was forced to answer. And I'm very impressed with some way, somehow, may God help, God help me for sure. I was able to come up with the answer. The question, how did you, uh, how could you leave? And I said, the reason I left was because the war was so horrific. I told you earlier that explosion happened every night. So when we had a chance to leave, we just jumped on, you know, whatever, climb over the gate, whatever, to leave because we're afraid that the war will continue. So that's how I left. Uh, and when I told them that about my fear with the explosion at night, the, the, the crowd, the audience whispered to each other, yeah, we did, it happened to us too. The second question, how could you live among uh, people who, who, uh, who consider you as enemy? And I said, you know, there's a big difference between the politicians and the real people. Because even the old, um, I, I saw they build bridges, roads, streets, hospitals, schools for us. And they did not shoot at us except at one incident that I didn't know until the My Lai uh, massacre. And so, and, uh, and, and the third question was, um, did the American ever ad admit that they are losing? I read, uh, Eric Maria remark, he's the journalist who wrote the book Art de Triomphe, uh, or um, it's a wonderful book, uh, anti-war book, and he said that the victory of all war is the end of it. So I, told, I shared with them that quote, and I said, Many American uh, mothers, fathers, wives, like Vietnamese mother, father's wife, wife, lost their sons and husband, brother and sisters uh, in this war. So everybody's very grateful that the war's over. So, and I left at that. And one, per, one person came up to me and said, thank you for sharing because it really helped healing of what she had to go through with her own family with the war uh, that the other people also said the same thing. So this brought me back to your question back there about, about black uh, and white and about injustice and discrimination. This, this doctor, she's from the north, she's a communist. I was from the south, didn't like communists, she didn't like I share with her all of the things I went through, how scared I was, and she realized that we do have a lot in common. So to answer your question, out of something, I ha we have to believe that out of something very difficult, very ugly, there's still some beauty in it because we are human. Hum there's something so beautiful in humanity. We have to have the heart and the eye to see that or else life is a terrible place to be. Thank you. I love you all. Arts here, so feel free to, like I said, I'm committed to help you to grow, so feel free to use my card and uh, mail me. I'd be happy to meet you in Boston or in Worcester or wherever, yeah? Yes, and just as a closing as well, we do have um, a sign sheet in the back if 